Our next speaker is the inimitable uh, Neil Gemmell, who, through some quirk of the program, will be speaking to us for 30 minutes. So it'll be 30 minutes of insight and joy. Are you ready now? Yeah, thanks. Good, go. Yeah. Right. Tenakata <laughs> Katoa. So my name's Neil Gemmell, I'm a Professor of Reproduction Genomics and I'm based at the University of Otago. And I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to talk today about some ideas we've been thinking about for a while now about genetic tools for pest eradication and control. Uh, and what I'm going to try and convince you of is that this is absolutely not crazy, but it is very ambitious. So if you went to James Russell's talk and you went to Peter Dean's talk, you've probably got 90% of what I'm going to tell you about uh, this afternoon. But let's start with the basics. So New Zealand is a pretty special place. Um, we are isolated both by geography and if you like our fauna is isolated in time, having been set here adrift for some period of millions of years. And we have unique and special species that exist only here. And I guess I was reading uh, some literature uh, that was published last week that was saying, look, why would you bother controlling predators? Um, you know, the Anthropocene is here, everything is going to be everywhere, and the world is just going to be one great big shopping mall of biodiversity. So it'll be a great place if you like Big Macs, which are the cockro cockroaches would be the equivalent of that, or sparrows, or various other things that E.O. Wilson has pointed out that the world will be dominated by if we don't do something about it. And quite frankly, day by day, this country gets just a little bit less special, OK? As new incursions appear, myrtle rust just last week, uh, various other things, they are going to have devastating, or have had devastating impacts on our natural biodiversity, and they will continue to have devastating impacts on our natural biodiversity without the stalwart efforts of us all. And I guess the challenge to us is to leave an environment which is better for our children than the one that we have inherited. This is going to be a fairly emotive talk with some data. All right, so where, how did we get here? We got here through two main forces. First, um, unrestrained habitat destruction, and this dates back to basically uh, the arrival of humans on this landmass, although it would be fair to say there have been many geological challenges that have also disrupted our landmass over the years. But we've lost uh, lots of forest, and we have introduced a huge number of invasive species. I'm going to focus predominantly on mammals because that is the predator-free challenge. Uh, so with Polynesians, whoops, actually it should be about eight, eight, 850 uh, years BP, not 850 AD. We arrived, we have Kiori, we have Kuri uh, arriving with Polynesian uh, settlers. And around about 1869, 1870, uh, 1770, sorry, we've got uh, mice and rats and probably pigs and a few other things left by um, those early voyages of exploration. And then through uh, a variety of deliberate introductions, because clearly um, you needed to have things like rabbits to hunt and provide food, you needed therefore when they burst uh, uh, uncontrolled because they had no natural predators. You needed to introduce stoats, ferrets, weasels, and various other things to control those. We also introduced foxes. They didn't take off here, but they're a major problem in Australia. And of course, you needed to have various other things that you could eat. And then you'd just bring in some stuff because you can, like zebras, uh, which, uh, um, again, thankfully went extinct. And mongooses, because, you know, you could and native quolls from Australia, and the list goes on. So the list is actually incredibly long of mammalian introductions. And I don't think I need to convince many of you that this was a terrible idea. And the impacts of these species weren't recognised for many, many years, or if they were, it was considered that the New Zealand native species were maladapted or inferior to those that were introduced, and in fact they probably deserve to go extinct. Okay? That was sort of a Victorian era of view, is that obviously we'd bring in these fitter things from Europe or where, elsewhere, and, and they were just superior. And I guess we started uh, maybe 100 years ago to start to recognise that what we have here is special. And in fact, any of you, who's, who's been overseas? Who hasn't been overseas might be quicker. All right. So one of the things that's fabulous about travelling to other countries as a New Zealander is the recognition that what we have here is different and it is special. 
okay? And I think we take it for granted without that lens of looking back in on ourselves from an overseas perspective. We have learnt, and probably the Big South Cape Island ex uh, experience in the early 60s was one of the most profound changes in mindset about the impact of these species. So rats erupted in Big South Cape Island, 1962-63. They remained high for three years. Nine landbird species that were uh, occurred on that island declined or disappeared. We lost the greater short-tailed bat. Um, we lost a large number of invertebrates and we lost a flightless weevil. And that was a microcosm of the impact of these species right across our landscape. But it was there and it was in our face. And I think it led to a realisation that extinctions were happening at an unprecedented rate within our time, within our lives. Um, we are probably, well, I'll cut to the chase, we are the silver medal winner on global extinctions, at least for vertebrates. I don't know about um, micro, uh, microbial fauna, probably pretty, pretty high up there too. So we've lost 69 of 245 bird species, and if you break that down, it's 69 of 161 non-marine species. We've lost a bunch of amphibians, we've lost reptiles, we've lost a freshwater fish, we've lost various vascular plants, and this slide is probably a little bit out of date. But I didn't have time to really um, dwell on that. So we win silver, we love to win stuff. Uh, but this is not a competition that you want to win. And if we're not uh, really careful, we will win gold. There is almost nothing more certain that if we do nothing, that we will win the gold medal for avian extinctions at least within my lifetime. You could argue that species like kākāpō, kāki, pātiki, and some of our kiwis will probably go extinct in our lifetimes if we don't do anything. And that would be profoundly sad. Many of these are on the brink. I mean, some would argue these are already extinction debts. They're just, it's just a matter of time. I'm not that pessimistic. <clears throat> As a consequence of our realisation of how profound an impact these pests have had on our native species, a very large swathe of the conservation dollar in this country is about pest control. And if I've got a key message here, it's got to be about a lot of different things. This is uh, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff stuff, predominantly. And, you know, when we control pests and populations start to respond and bird populations grow, where are we going to put them? Our offshore islands are teeming with birds in some instances, and we're losing uh, the capability to, to do that. So mainland islands, things like that become really important. And we reckon the introduced species cost us and this is probably where the, the buck stops, about 3.3 billion per annum, give or take. And a lot of that is driven by uh, the impact on uh, primary production by things like TB and possums. But, and here's the thing, what is the value in terms of lost uh, ecosystem functions and lost ecological uh, capabil uh, capabilities? And the reality is, is that most of you who are working in the ecology space know it's a really hard argument because you can't pin a very... Uh, compelling figure on that. It's going to be a really big number, but it's hard to convince Treasury that that is the case. We are really good at killing stuff, including our native birds, but we're really good at killing these pest species. We have a global leading edge in this area. And as we have announced now this idea of eradicating mammalian pests, uh, at least the three big ones, by 2050, people in Washington DC, the Americans think that we're ahead of the curve. They're falling behind us. They don't like to be behind anything, right? Uh, but we are. We are incredibly good at pest control, and that pest control has to be efficient, specific, and cost-effective. And we have uh, made huge inroads over decades uh, in improving that on a cost per animal or a cost per hectare basis. And we've sh used shooting, trapping, poisoning, disease, fertility control, and a host of other things. Uh, this is a rabbit with RCD. Apparently this is what they look like. The legs go out like that, just so you know. And uh, you can probably guess that these were probably killed with cyanide. We have been able to increasingly manage pests or manage the eradication of pest species like rats at increasingly large scales. So this is a slide from McLeod and um, James Russell's work, published over a decade ago now, and you can see the steady increase in, uh, in, in the in the area uh, that in which eradication can be achieved uh, by date. And if we come out here, 
probably James would say that um, islands like Stewart Island could be achievable within uh, reasonable timescales. And in fact, if you extrapolate his graph out to uh, 2050, we'll probably be able to do the mainland of New Zealand if, uh, with that steady state increase. But the reality is it's probably we're getting to a point now where um, the existing technologies will start to asymptote off and no longer have the same control capability um, that we need at those huge landscape scales. So, economically important, devastating to our wildlife, and a major national goal was announced last year to make us predator-free by 2050. Let's focus on this goal, and in particular, on this last one, that we want to achieve a breakthrough science solution capable of eradicating at least one small mammalian predator by 2025. So what's that, eight years? We've been thinking about this for a while. Is Jeff Hicks here? Kira? So we've been thinking about this stuff for a while, and Jeff invited me and a bunch of other people to have a talk about how we might achieve a pest-free New Zealand by 2050 back in 2012. And hell, that was a great meeting. It was, a, you know, it was, that was it had a profound way of influencing what has happened in the last five years. So congratulations for arranging that. And the vision there was that we would have an environment in which those mammalian pests weren't necessarily eradicated, but they were no longer a threat to the security of New Zealand's indigenous biota or condition of ecosystem services, which I think is a great vision. We went through two days where we parked our preconceptions at the door and really just talked about what we might need. And we came up with these sorts of things that went across a sort of a dragon's den, as it was at that time, uh, concept. We recognised that we needed ways to detect these things in their environment really cheaply and quickly and at low densities. We needed to have people really care and passionate about dealing with this problem with a mass mobilisation of, of community. We needed champions who would actually get the strategic vision uh, of, of this ecologically based pest management underway and keep and keep walking, keep working with it. We needed lures to attract things to the existing uh, trap technologies. We needed new toxins and devices so that we actually had better mouse or stoat or um, you know a hedgehog or, or possum traps. And we needed an agency for leadership, oversight, and delivery. That's what we that's what we reckon, recognised at that time. And, oh, and we needed a walk-away technology, if you like, a genetic tool which would enable us to cheaply and quickly, without having to go back and check it all the time, actually work to eradicate these species. Now, five years on, there is no silver bullet out there. Peter's already told you that gene drives are not a silver bullet, but they could be a very important part of the, of the solution. We need all these tools, and we need coordination among the people who are developing this. We need improvements and best practice from old approaches. We need new game changes. And we need a nonpartisan, mission-led coordination. So one of the big problems, and I'm going to go on a rant now, OK? So social media people, I'm ranting. We have a major problem in this country in that we have set up a competitive funding system which is counterproductive to us working together. That needs to change, and it's been like that for decades. And various other tools that are now used to measure our productivity act against us. PBRF is about an individual. Individual projects. So we all want our money, we all want our papers, and we all want the kudos. But we are not going to solve this problem by one person doing it, you know, and publishing in Nature. Right? That is not how this is going to be solved. So hey, Amen, brother. We need a... Hey, can I get a hallelujah? No, but... Yeah. I've been, I've been watching some 60s um, speeches recently. You'll see this coming through. <laughs> I have a dream. And stuff like that. And that's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Or you can do for the challenge. All right. So I'm here as the after, after lunch, uh, postprandial sort of um, knock you out of your seat type talk, I think. Right, so here's where we're at in the biological heritage current state of play. So we are investing, or has been investing, uh, in landscape genetics, the development of biosensors and eDNA technologies that can be used to detect these species at scale in a relatively uh, quick and low-cost way. Or at least that's the idea. We are mining genomes when we are getting genomes, and we need to get more genomes for these mammalian pest species, including 
but believe it or not, the common the, the black rat, ratus ratus, has not been sequenced. Uh, so we're doing that. We have to sequence possum, we have to sequence stoat, and we need to mine those genomes and find if there are vulnerabilities that might enable us to develop species-specific toxins. And then I'm going to tell you about a couple of genetic technologies that I've been working on. But before I do that, I'm going to start with um, something that people will consider a failure, but it's not. So we spent 15 years in this country investing in immunocontraception uh, strategies to eradicate possums. We developed the capacity to uh, deliver genes which would set up an immunological reaction in the possum so it would destroy its own oocytes. We could do that. And then, and only after we'd done all the science, we started to think, oh, well, what if resistance emerges? What if this thing starts to spread across the Tasman? What would the Australians say if we eradicated all their, um, all their marsupials? You know? And so it would be fair to say, Australia's pretty keen at taking most of the things that are... Oh, actually, Russell Crowe's on there. I don't know if that's good. But <laughs> you can have them back. Um, but, you know, lots of good stuff, they claim. Um, but they don't want this, which was the nematode worm that was going to deliver the vaccine which was going to make these possums sterile. That would have eradicated sugar gliders and honey possums and a whole bunch of things that Australians care about. So we needed a different way. My point about raising that is that we need to start the discussion about what we think is going to happen in the environment when we do these things before we do them. Before we invest in doing the experiment, let's have a conversation and intelligently try to predict what might happen. I'm going to tell you about one which I think would be pretty cool and relatively safe, and of course it's my idea, so I'm biased. Um, but basically it's an idea called Trojan females, and it revolves around the idea that this, this molecule, molecule here, the mitochondrial DNA, which is important for mitochondrial function, the batteries of the cell, if you like, is maternally inherited. And what we've discovered is there are mutations in that molecule which don't affect females, but they do affect males, and in fact they profoundly affect male fertility. And we wondered if we could turn this into a biocontrol. And it's a very, very simple idea. You introduce Trojan females that carry these mutations into a population, and as more and more of those persist in the population, you get fewer and fewer fertile males, and ultimately you'll get some population control. Really simple, um, and we've even done some really cool maths to prove that. And even better, we went and did an experiment with everyone's favourite, the fruit fly. And this paper just came out last week, and I'm pretty, pretty proud of this paper too. So what we've got here are fruit flies with different mitochondrial types. This mitochondrial type, uh, the TF mitochondrial type, confers a level of infertility on males in the population. They're not completely infertile, probably 70% uh, of the fertility of wild type. And over 10 generations, when we introduce these mutations into the population, we get an 8% reduction in population growth over that time scale. And OK, that's not a huge, you know, ooh, they're extinct. Um, but that is a slow, gradual progress, and it is almost uh, inevitable if you introduce these things that you will get this population suppression. And now what we're looking at is whether we could use this to, uh, uh, as a control tool for clover root weevils. We're working on this with mice, and we're also working on this with wasps as part of the National Science Challenge. The nice thing about it is that it's contained within its species and it's fully reversible. If you ever wanted to reintroduce fertility, you just introduce females that don't carry that mutation. And one of the things I like about the idea of genetic control tools is that being able to turn them off is really important. Let's talk about gene drives briefly, and uh, Peter has talked to you about this this morning, and I'm going to make this as simple as I possibly can. This is genetic cheating. Okay? This is loaded dice, this is double-sided coins. This is some way of pushing the odds in our favour so that the, mo the genes that are inherited from one generation to the next are the ones that we want, not a 50-50 split as per normal Mendelian rules of inheritance. And here it is uh, illustrated in mosquitoes, because it almost always is, uh, where this is our normal form of inheritance, so we have a mutation here that we're interested in, and that quickly gets diluted out of the population, the gene does not spread. Whereas with a gene drive, it does, because where this exists, it cuts and repairs the DNA uh, in a precise way to basically edit itself into the adjacent chromosome, the sister chromosome. It's not perfect, but it works pretty, pretty, pretty darn good um, in, in lab settings anyway. 
Um, and this stuff is happening in, at an incredible speed. So this is actually only up to February 2016, but here's a couple of quick milestones. So Austin Burt proposed this idea in 2003, long lag, and then Kevin Esfeld and colleagues show in 2014, in theory you can do it. Then you've got people by 2015 actually doing it in flies in a lab population, and then uh, we start talking about safety issues. Well, that's good. Um, and then people start actually engineering mosquitoes so that they are unable to carry their malaria parasite or they are unable to reproduce. And that was a year ago in mosquitoes. And uh, none of these things, as Peter's pointed out, have, have succeeded uh, yet, but I think it's only a matter of time as we design better and better tools. Gene drives and rodents are miles behind where we are at uh, for flies and uh, mosquitoes. There are two natural gene drives, the T allele and R2D2. Yes, geneticists do have a sense of humour. Um, and these are naturally occurring uh, what they call meiotic distorters, and they will push a particular allele through a population. But they're not widespread in uh, mouse populations, and unless we can figure out a way so that we can take away some, some lethal effects that these have, they're not going to work. So enter CRISPR systems, so the same sort of CRISPR systems that are being used in fruit flies and mosquitoes could be used in mouse. And there are people at the University of Adelaide, Paul Thomas and colleagues, who have developed a CRISPR-Cas9 mouse. Um, and we're just seeing if it's, uh, if it's got into the germline. <coughs> a gene drive by itself will do nothing except pass itself on. It needs to be linked to a cargo gene which does stuff. That cargo gene will limit fertility, it will distort sex ratios, it could heighten the sensitivity of the animal to existing toxins or pathogens, and it can even weaken and kill them. Here's my Walt Disney friendly uh, explanation of a gene drive. So we've got Mickey Mouse here and Minnie Mouse. Mickey carries a gene which makes basically all his progeny uh, male. So they have male progeny. They meet another Minnie Mouse, probably not its mother, that would be wrong. Um, and then they have more minis, uh, Mickeys and more Mickeys and, and so forth and so forth. And ultimately you have a population full of Mickeys uh, with a voice that acts as an instant, instant contraceptive. So there you go. That's how it works and this diagram's not perfect because about half those Mickeys would be infertile. But that's the basic premise that we're talking about. All right, so one of the questions I often get when I'm giving this sort of spiel is that, hey, life will find a way. And I go, yes, thank you, Jurassic Park. There are many, many things that we know can go wrong with this. One of the biggest concerns I have is how do you, how do you turn these things off? And at the moment, the answer is you use another gene drive, which seems not a very compelling solution to a problem which we are already saying could potentially run through populations un unchecked. But mutation, a good old friend, random genetic uh, change by mutation, can turn these gene drives off. It can either turn the gene drive off or it can turn the cargo off. If it does turn the gene drive off, it stops pushing through the population. If it turns the cargo off, you might lose your suppressive effect. These are both bad things, and so the way around that is to have multiple gene drives, probably within an organism, multiple, multiple uh, switches pushing that through because mutation is random. The chances of getting a mutation in one gene is low. The chance of getting a mutation in two, three, four, five genes is extremely low. But the other things that we don't know is actually what does this do to the animal's biology? How is this going to change its ability to survive and persist in the wild? Are female mice that find a male with a gene drive going to go, oh, actually, I don't fancy you? No thanks, I'm not going to mate with you? Um, or maybe um, they're particularly dumb? Or, you know, maybe they can't survive in the wild very well because basically they've been growing up in, in labs. And I'll come to that point shortly about what do we do with these things and how are we going to get there. Um, likely we can do this, should we? This is a very important discussion point. Now, come back to my immunocontraception point, which is that we started with the science. And then we did testing, and then we did some risk assessment. We also did some public engagement, actually. Uh, and it was one of the few areas of GMO that the New Zealand public said, OK, we, we, could, we could live with the idea of GMO if it'll get rid of possums. We need to have the conversation starting here to explain what the science is about and find out whether we have what we're going to call a social licence to operate, uh, which I think is the next session, to do this sort of stuff. And we have to understand this in a national and international context. So New Zealanders hate these pest species with a passion. Um, who's from overseas? All right. So have you ever been in a car with a Kiwi who has swerved across the road to try and kill a stoat or a possum? If you've driven on the west coast of South Island, very good chance. 
that generally scares the bejesus out of most people, uh, and they don't understand it. They don't understand that we have this uh, huge uh, aversion to these animals. And so the New Zealand context is going to be completely different to the international context. I'm winding it up. How much time have I got? Like minutes. Two? Oh, God. All right. So we need to understand public acceptance uh, of, of, of predator-free goal and of the gene drives that are both a national and global context. Our pests are not all global issues. Rats are cosmopolitan. People are going to care about those. Stoats are not. They're, they're a problem here in New Zealand and the Orkney Islands, and they've only arrived in the Orkney Islands six years ago. Um, in Australia, brush-tailed possums are cherished because they're in decline. Poor darlings. They can have them all back. I'll pay for the shipping container myself. Have them back. Um, and, you know, this is their previous distribution. This is where it is now. We've got a... Uh, whereas, conversely, they are loving it here. I'm going to quickly finish, quickly finish, um, with the point that we can do this. It's going to take time. I think mice is a great case study. It's a global problem. We can uh, galvanise dollars internationally to do this, and in fact there's already a consortium interested in doing this on mice called G-Bird. Um, we need to do modelling. We need to do, in the, in the lab, transgenic manipulations. These are happening. We need, yeah, my beautiful assistant, Peter Dearden. Um, we, yeah, <laughs> we need to do microcosm experiments. We need to do things on mass at islands. It's going to take at least 2025 for mice. All these other things are going to be much, much harder. Um, Rats, we don't know how to do much on the way of transgenics. Peter's already talked about stoats and possums. We don't know enough about their genomics, really, to be um, able to do that. And all the cap capability in possum breeding and genomics uh, basically finished about 10 years ago. So my conclusion, this is an audacious goal. It's not crazy. We can do it. We can work as a collective. We need to resource it for the duration. We need to remain nimble, adopting new approaches as needed to achieve the mission. And this is our space race. Say that again. That was a good one. This is our space race. Excellent. Now shut up. Yeah. Yeah. We choose to eradicate pests and do the other things. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Rod. So we, we push them we push them through the population. Okay, so we release we release females initially at reasonably high frequencies. So we eradicate down, and then we work into a population in which uh, there is um, relatively low numbers of individuals, and then we release Trojan females at a decent density. And our modelling would suggest that we can get those to persist over time. In fact, with the fruit flies, that's what we, we actually got an increase in frequency of the Trojan female mitochondrial mutation over ten generations. Um, just wondering, do you know what the incidences are of possums going over to Australia? Because I know rats just go on ships all the time. So I don't, I'm not aware of any possums going back over to Australia. Um, so, yeah. But where the immunocontraception thing fell down was that there was a, we were talking about a virus which would then be infected into a nematode which then could be spread uh, through avian migration back across the Tasman. I mean, most things come in from the other side in terms of... Um, uh, animals and, and plants, but Double yeah, bumblebees went the other way, did they? Yeah. All right. Are there any further questions?